today. Sorry, um, haven't slept in a while. We've got uh, a lot going on today. We need some. Uh, we need some simchas in this in this shul. Unfortunately, um, for those of you who don't know, Aaron Chait lost his brother uh, late last night. Um, so we'll uh, have to uh, learn in, in Eli Nishmas for his brother. Uh, but we do thank Heshi and Miriam Gutterman for sponsoring today. In memory of Miriam's bro- mother, Regina Braff, Rivka Basa Fryan. Uh, also, wish a mouse on the bar mitzvah. Thank you. Right. Cool. How did he do? Great. I'm sure he did beautifully. I wasn't at all surprised to hear that. Baruch Hashem. Okay, we'll start with celebrating uh, that simcha with you. And we're excited to celebrate many more, but Ezra Hashem. Okay, we're up to Shema. A very exciting Shema, but we also have Pesach coming up, so we kind of have to, we have to at least consider the opportunity that both of those um, parts of our, our religion present. So we'll start like we like to do, bless you, we'll start like we like to do with a, a little vort connected to the Parsha, or in this case Pesach, but I have one that's connected to Shema, because Shema is a really nice theme of the Pesach Seder, if you think about it. A lot of discussion about Shema. Um, of course, we know the famous, the most interesting part, the most obvious part, is the story with the five rabbis, Maisa, Rabbi Lanzer, right, with the five rabbis. And of course, it ends with Higiyazman, Kriyat Shema, the time for Shema has come. Um, that's how the story ends, and many say that's more of a metaphor. Could be referring to the Bar Kochla revolts, where they got the green light, and the, the code was that Zman for Kriyat Shema has come. But in any event, uh, Kriyat Shema is a huge part of our Seder as well. Echad mi yodea. I learned something interesting this week. Echad mi yodea. So who's still awake by echad mi yodea? I'm not. Usually. I'll be honest. Or not in the kitchen. Or not in the kitchen. <laughs> That's true. I'm awake. I'm just cleaning up. Yeah, I, I don't know the last time I can remember. I'll be honest, you know, uh, that the last time I said nirza. Um, uh, it's been a while. So I apologize. But uh, you know, there's so much going on. Um, so echad mi yodea, the source for it, along with chad gad yad, it's a little more popular, I think. Um, no, they're both, they're both. I think if you say one, you say them all. If you don't say, you just skip near it and you're done. Uh, but nonetheless, the, they're actually found, the writings of them, in an old shul in Garmaiza, hundreds of years ago. And it was established to be sung, Leo Seder. It was established to be sung. We don't know the author, we have no idea. Um, we also don't know the author of the Haggadah, by the way. But nonetheless, we definitely don't know the author of anyone who sang anything in Nirza. But um, Rav Shlomo Aaron Vartimer was not the author, but it was recorded in the Haggadah of the Chachmi Yerushalayim. He says the reason for this piyut, if you will, I don't know what to call it, song, um, if you will, uh, is the minag used to be, they, they used to daven mariv, interesting now, the, the minag is the opposite, they would daven mariv early, Leal Haseder. They wanted to get the Seder going. You know, so, yeah, it's a great idea. They know what they're doing here. Um, they, they would dab and mire very early, which for all the non-observant people I've had at my house over the years for a Pesach Seder, they would have loved this. Um, you know, when they, when they find out that the Seder is at like 8.30 or, you know, then they say, I'm so sorry, I can't attend or, or, uh, you know, maybe I'll come for a little bit. So it's unfortunate, but they used to, interesting enough, they used to dab and mire very early. Um, they all say they made early yantiv, which was somewhat controversial because you really need to wait until, say, so Chavim, but... At the very least, you need to wait till Seisach come to make Kiddush. Of course, we make early Shabbos in the shul, and many shuls out there. So it's the same logic. You dab in Marev while it's still light outside after a certain point. It's 10, in, 10 hours and 45 minutes, halachic, halachic hours into the day. It's called Plag HaMincha. So the day starts at 6 and ends at 6. That's 4.45. So there's what to rely on. But nonetheless, they used to do this. So the only issue with doing that is you need to say Kriyash Mabizmana at the right time, at the three stars. So they would repeat Kriyash Mab, but they would forget just like the most common forgotten night of Sphira is the first night. Why? Because you don't say it in shul usually, unless you wait until, uh, depending on how late Mara bends, usually it's not late enough, but so you don't say it in shul, and then you go and you fall asleep after the Seder, so you forget to say uh, Sphira the first night. So nonetheless, so they would repeat, they'd have to repeat Kriya Shema at the Seder, so what would they do? So they instituted Echad Miodeya to remind them Echad, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, which is one of our themes of Shema, the Yichud of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the oneness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So therefore, they instituted it sort of as like, at the end of the Seder, oh, don't forget, you still have to say Shema. That was the, the reason for it. So, 
Uh, interesting. I thought that was a nice idea. A good Pesach, uh, Devar Torah, uh, for those who are still awake by the end of the Seder. The second night, they couldn't do that. The second, the second. Correct. Night. Correct. Second night, they would not be able to do that. Um, they were counting, but maybe that it reminded them to count Sphira, maybe. <laughs> they reminded them they needed to do, uh, they continued it the second night, maybe. I didn't um, bring with me, but I had a beautiful dry Torah how every one of the Aseris and Libros I've mm-hmm. mentioned or referred to the Hester in the first paragraph of Shema. Ah, yeah, very good. He went okay. all the way through and he did each of the Aseris and I have to share that. I have, yeah, the, I have. let's. Uh, there's a lot of literature written on that. Yeah, there's a lot of literature written on this. Eretz Um absolutely about how it connects to the first line. We start with we'll start with Behafta. We'll get to that. That in terms of what that does and uh, understanding Yichud B'Kadosh Baruch Hu Zatan Ochi Hashem Alkecha. Right, excellent. All of our themes that we'll discuss are Shema. So first things first, we'll start Shema. I don't think we'll finish it today, but we can finish it. We'll take a break and then uh, we'll come back after Yom to finish Shema. I don't want to rush it. Pretty important tefillah. It's Del Raisa, it's a biblical obligation, as we mentioned in the past. So the Abu Raham says the word Shema contains allusions to major Jewish concepts. Shema, Shin Mem Ayin. Se'u Marom Enechem, Shin Mem Ayin. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. How often should we do that? Shema, Shin Mem Ayin. Shachris, Mincha, Marv. Shema, or Arvi, really. Yeah, we Ashkenaz say Arv, Marv. But Shema, Shachris, Mincha, Arvit, Mar. Do it again. Su. Su. Marom enechem. Lift your eyes to Shemayim. How often? Shachris, Mincha, Arvit. Morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, the message is that Shakai, Melech, Olam. That Akadosh Baruch Hu is the Supreme King. Shakai, Melech, Olam. Shin, Mem, Ayin. Say my game. Wait. Where in Mincha? We don't say Shema, but they're supposed to dive with Hashem every. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't perfect. And of course, we need to accept all Malchus Shemayim. That's one of our the points of Shema. Accepting the yoke of heaven. All Malchus Shemayim. You just have to go the other way. Ayin Mem Shin. Shin Mem Ayin. Same idea, which is a backwards acrostic of Shema. Okay. Thought that was cool. There is one opinion, Tosos and Sota, that seems to say Shema is the Rabbanan, Rabbinic. But uh, most authorities hold it's a biblical obligation, as we mentioned in the past. It's the Raisa. The Rambam lists, lists it as his 10th mitzvah assay. The tenth of his positive commandments, Likros Kriyashma Pa'amayim Bechol Yom, that you have to read it twice, not three times, fair point, twice during your day. How do I know you need to say Shema twice a day? Bishach Becha, Uvkubecha. You're supposed to say it Shach Becha, evening, when you're Shchiba, lying down, Uvkubecha. In fact, some in the Gemara learn it to be literal. You're supposed to be lying down while you say it. We don't hold of that. But nonetheless, Uvkubecha, and when you get up in the morning, so night and morning, Shach Becha, Uvkubecha. How much of Shema do you have to hear? Do you have to say to fulfill your mitzvah? I mean, we know the answer to this one. Just like when we discuss how much of the Megillah do you have to hear to be Yotze, although it's four-way machlokas. We hold like Rabbi Meir, the most strict opinion. You have to hear all of it. You would imagine we do the same for Shema. Um, but the Gemara, interestingly enough, the Gemara in Brachos says there are those who say either the first line of Shema would be enough or the first paragraph. Some say the first two paragraphs would be enough. Of course, we hold like the Rambam that you guessed it. You need to say all three paragraphs to fulfill the Torah's obligation. Okay, it's not exactly terribly long. It's, uh, I think we're, we're accustomed to, to that by now. So the three paragraphs of Shema are not arranged, you'll notice, in order. Ever notice that? According to the order of the Torah? They're not in the order of the Torah. For example, the third paragraph, right, we're going to call the Parsha Tzitzis, uh, if you will, because it details laws of, of laws of Tzitzis. That's from the end of Parsha Shlach. And they'll say from Bar. While the first paragraph is from the Eschanan, which is the beginning of Sefer Devarim, after Parsha Shlach, about five Parshas after it. And the second paragraph is a little later, from the end of Parshas Akev. So it really goes out of order in, in the, all three paragraphs. The purpose, we'll see why we did that uh, in a little bit. The purpose of the first line of Shema we mentioned is to convey the idea of Yichud Hashem. Right? Hashem is one, that's a very important fundamental concept of Judaism. Rashi on the Pasuk of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, again, that's in Be'eschanan, in Sefer Dvarim, says it means Hashem, who is only our God now. Totally different way of, I think, the way we've been accustomed to understanding this Pasuk. Rashi's understanding is Hashem, who is only our God now, as he was rejected by the rest of the world, 
will soon be recognized by everyone. That's the way Rashi understands the Pasuk of Shema. I think it's a totally, when I read this, totally different understanding than I ever had. I never thought of it this way. According to Rashi, this is a tefillah for the future. Essentially saying, Shema Yisrael Hashem lo Hashem Echad. We, even though right now he's Echad to only us, eventually he will be to everyone. Interesting way of looking at it. I would have thought it's just detailing our here and now relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the present, not worrying about what's going to happen in the future and who's going to be the Yachid uh, Hashem in the future. But, but that's not enough. Correct. Correct. And we'll get to that as well. We'll start with, uh, with that. And then we'll, we'll do... Oh, we did come off that one last time, right? We did? Yes. To get us to 248, we did come off that one. We got up to the first Pasuk last time. Okay, I should have reviewed a little bit. I apologize. Okay, so... The uh, according to Rashi, Shema is a tefillah for the future, where we will all one day recognize Kodesh Baruch Hu. In the Torah, you'll notice what about the letters? Speaking of letters, we know Vayikra has a small aleph in this week's yeah. parsha. That one we knew, but maybe you didn't know that the first line of Shema, the there are two letters of the first line of Shema are larger than the others. Not so the opposite of Vayikra, mm-hmm. right? Vayikra the aleph is small. In Shema, the ayin of Shema and the dalid of Echad are larger. So it's shin mem, big ayin, right? And then it goes eventually echad, aleph, ches, and then big dalit. Okay, so in regards to the dalit, it's brought down that we need to remember it as echad. It must be aleph, ches, dalit, not aleph, ches. Dalit looks very similar to a reish. A reish, what would be the problem with saying that? Acher. That's like the opposite. That's much worse. <laughs> Rather, you not say Shema than say that Hashem Acher, there are other gods, God forbid. That's like the, the worst thing you could say. Uh, addition by subtraction. It's like when, um, you know, I had a, a student write an essay and um, they were trying to spell um, whatever it was, either Fuchs or fire truck, and you can figure out the rest from here. Um, and, uh, you know, they, were not, they did not mean it. I, I assure you, I'm not being naive. They did not mean, but uh, nonetheless, um, you know, sometimes we, it's better to <laughs> get our spelling right. So we know that Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekino Hashem Echad, not Acher. So we want to make sure we stress that Dalit. Why the two letters, though? That explains the Dalit. Why right? the Dalit is big. What about the Ches? Excuse me, what about the Ayin of Shema? So the Abu Raham says, because Ayin and Dalit spell what word? Aid. Aid. Mm-hmm. Right? Aid as in by saying Shema, we are Aidim. We are serving as witnesses, which is the whole point of Shema. The Balaturim says those two letters were, interestingly enough, were written larger to direct our attention to the fact that the statement bookended by these two letters expresses the foundation of Judaism, meaning it's almost like this would be easier if I had a, a chalkboard. But you, so it's Shema Yisrael Shem Lekin Hashem Echad. So you have the Ayin on one side and the Dal on the other side, as in look in between here. This is really important. Focus your attention right now on this line. That's one way the Balaturim says. Okay. The Gemara Bracha says... Tanya Sumchas Omer Kola Ma'arich Be'echad Ma'arich in Lo Yom Nushnosav. Maybe you know this. Maybe you've seen this. Echad, right? You stress the word Echad. You've seen people um, elongate the stress the word Echad. That if we extend the pronunciation of Echad, our lives will be extended. So it's a zechus for an richus yamun for a long life. Interesting. Amar Av Acha Bar Yaakov Uba Dalas and the Dalit. Same thing with the Dalit. We should especially extend the last letter. It's not enough just for the Echad. Echad. You don't want to do it for, I've seen people spend like 10 minutes on the Dalit there. Now, you take, now you're saying a different word. So that might be problematic. But Echad. You want to make sure you know it's Echad, not Acher. And you want to stress the, emphasize the, the Ches. So you are, excuse me, you should emphasize the word Echad uh, as well to be Ma'arichin Lo Yamav Ushinosav. So, obviously, we're not going to get into the theological discussions. I know many people who have passed way too young who are very mocked on this. Um, you know, we don't have that uh, understanding in this world, nor do we have the understanding of the world. I know people who were the perfect child, took care of their parents, and passed away very young, even though the Torah promises that, that if you honor your parents, you'll live a long life. So, you know, we don't have that understanding on this world. We are, we are told these uh, ideas, so we pass them along. Um, you know, I don't know the exact equation of everything that goes on upstairs. Okay, that's the first Pasuk of Shema. Then we get to, before we have to, Baruch Shem Kavod Mach Sodom Bet. So we interrupt the continuity, we interrupt this uh, program. No, we interrupt the continuity of the Shema by saying, Baruch Shem Kavod Mach Sodom Bet. 
So our minhag, interestingly enough, is to say it silently. Silently, except on Yom Kippur. We say it out loud. Now we're like, Malachim. Remember the minhag of the Beis HaMikdash was they would say, Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalam Ba'ed, after every bracha. So instead of answering Amen, they would say, Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalam Ba'ed, they would say it out loud. So on Yom Kippur, we're like, Malachim, we can, we're on that level where we can handle it. But the rest of the year, we're not. So we say it silently. Um, what happens if you forget to say Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalam Ba'ed? Forget. Not sure why you would, but it's probably ingrained in our uh, whoever's saying Shema <laughs> says Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalam Ba'ed. I would venture to guess. But the Labush says, interestingly enough, you have not fulfilled your requirement. So he's the only one who says this. But he says you have not fulfilled your requirement to say Shema properly. That's even if you say it without kavana. We're going to see, but you do not fulfill your requirement according to Labush. Interesting. He holds Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalam Ba'ed has now been included as part of the requirement of the mitzvah of Shema, because it's also an expression, it's part of the Kabbalah's Omachu Shemayim aspect. However, as you could probably guess, the Bir Lacha and others say we follow the Bach, who holds you would be okay. You would not need to repeat Shema. It's obviously better to have Kabbalah, it's better to say it, not forget to say it, but if for whatever reason you forgot to say Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalamed, or you're just hearing for the first time ever that you're supposed to say Baruch Shein Kvom Aksalamed, you're okay, and... Uh, but starting tonight, say Baruch Shein Kulach Salamed. It's a good idea. This is also a tefillah when before people are mitzvah, you say Shema with them. Very good. Yeah, it's part of the Kabbalah Salamach Shemayim, part of the idea of accepting Hashem before they pass, mm-hmm. before uh, before the Shchid Meirah even, before the Vido Shchid Meirah, before the confession. That's part of the idea. That's the one part of tefillah that really encompasses our understanding of God's sovereignty. You know, the Olmach Shemayim, that's one of the most important tenets of Judaism. So we do it right before a person passes. Exactly. What's oh. the concept of covering your eyes? Okay, so cover your eyes is a minhag based off of the idea. Why do you cover your eyes when you... when Actually, no, that's a different answer. I shouldn't say that, but I was going to say by lighting candles. Raise your hand if you cover your eyes when you light candles. Everyone? Almost everyone. Okay, or just shy group. Okay, um, so the Shema is to make yourself have more kavana. Cover your eyes, you're focused. You make yourself more have more kavana. Why don't we cover our eyes by other parts of Tula we need to have kavana for? Shema might be the, the only main de'oraisa aspect, the only biblical aspect of our tefillah. Interestingly enough. Shemon Esrei, according to some, we'll get to, might be de'oraisa, might be biblical, but we don't really, we have other things, other ways to help us, um, other ways to help us zone in. You know, we're standing still, like Malachim. We're quiet. Unlike all other parts of our davening, we're supposed to be quiet during Shema. So it's a silent amidah. So Shema is the only part of our davening that's biblical that we need to really focus on. So we cover our eyes, extra line of kavana. Hadlachas Neros is a totally different reason. I stand corrected. I hope that you caught that uh, that correction. Um, we didn't want to say. Yeah, some have the minah who are makbid. They they cover their eyes to prevent themselves also from having kavana. Because they don't, they're not makabel Shabbos when they light candles, but mo, the minag has become when a woman lights uh, Shabbos candles, she's accepting Shabbos. We'll talk about what happens when, uh, when uh, if you want to go, you know, go to shul or you're going somewhere to eat, you want to drive before Shabbos, you already accept Shabbos when you accept, uh, light candles. Better to walk. Let's uh, let's leave it at that. But um, so that's at least Shema. We got through the first pasuk. Don't worry, we're not going to spend this much time on every line of Shema. Uh, I wanted to spend an extra amount of time. <coughs> on the first Pasuk of Shema to get us going, to get us ready for the rest of... We'll only spend, um, I don't know, that much uh, time on uh, Behafta, so we could stop here, at least have an idea of where we're going with, with Shema. And yes, sorry. When you say, you know, Pesach is Leil so do not say any part of Shema. Ah, very good. Um, so some say, you still say Kriya Shema. You don't say Amapil. The Amapil is supposed to say every night. You don't say that. And you don't say all the other parts. You take a look at the article center, what they say. You don't have to say that because Leil Shimurim. I believe we still say Kriya Shema. But you say the whole? No, just the first paragraph. First paragraph. First paragraph. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think if anyone has the minha to not say Kriya Shema. I don't think so. I think that they say, but Hamapil is taken away, which we say every night. Um, everything, a lot of other, a lot of people say it's like four pages. I, I don't say all that, but uh, I do say Hamapil in a couple of the paragraphs. So I don't say any of that on Pesach nights. Um, so because it's a little shimur. Both nights or one night? Both nights, yeah. Yeah. If, if we believe in this, if we're doing two sadarim, then we're, then we're going all out. That's my, that's my line. Awake, if we're awake. Uh, yes. 
I, have, I, I remember asking my rabbi in yeshiva that, and he said, uh, yeah, you're supposed to say everything. I said, really? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm 44 years old, and I, uh, I haven't done it yet. I haven't gotten to everything. I haven't, haven't stayed awake for the end, but you know, maybe one day I will. 